We are in a series called Balance. And uh, the intent of, of these teachings has to be to use the Scripture, the Word of God, to help guide us in areas of our life that over time can get unbalanced. In week one, I, I spoke about the, uh, the, the significance of, of our creation and, and I use the fact that over January, many of us have, have been away and we've, we've stopped to ponder what God has done with the, the water and the, the earth and the stars and the sky. But yet how sometimes by simply doing that, we can feel unbalanced ourselves about our own significance. We can think to ourselves, well, are we actually worthy? And in last week, I looked at a scripture where the Pharisees just couldn't seem to get their balance right between religion and relationship. And how at times we can, we can sort of scoff at reading the Pharisees and, and what they did, but, but we can actually sometimes ourselves get it a little bit wrong between rules and regulations. Rules and regulations and then relationship. How sometimes we, we want a desire to love a person, but it's actually hard. So, so we put these rules and regulations in place. Today, I want to spend some time exploring the balance between faith and fear. I want to start with a, a quote from an author by the name of Norman Peel. And he says this, In my opinion... There are two primary forces that drive our thinking, fear and faith. Both exist. Yet I have found that if you focus on one, it will eventually move you to sickness, despair and unhelpful thoughts. And only rarely will it motivate you to accomplishment. Yet it is my experience that only faith has the ability to set you free. The simple term of balance is the definition of it in, in, its, its, in its total is finding the equilibrium of opposing forces. I'm no engineer, thankfully. But it's finding the, 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 the balance, the equilibrium between two opposing forces. And my prayer is today, as, as we pray just at the start there as we were as we were singing, is that, is that God is using your very presence in the service here today to help set you free from maybe that which is holding you back. Fear is a multifaceted topic, and there's some areas of life that uh, don't just don't bother us at all. For some, we might be fearless. Well, for others, the very thought of doing exactly the same thing is, is, instills fear in us. I was staggered to find, as I was looking up fear, the amount of phobias there are in our world. And glossophobia, or the fear of public speaking, is thought to affect 75% of the adult population. This is according to the what's called the DSM, which is kind of like the mental health Bible. And for 25% of those 75% of people, it will actually manifest in physical symptoms. As you would expect, acrophobia or the fear of heights is very high up on the list of phobias, as is also arachnophobia and claustrophobia. But as I studied this, the, the DSM, I was disappointed to find that electorphobia, which is derived from the Greek word elector, which means rooster, and phobos, which means fear, and basically means to have an irrational fear of chickens. I'll show you why I have electorphobia. I mean, have a look at those things. Thank you very much to our sound team there. This is real for me, people. I have a phobia of chickens. 
It is a true story that I was running up Cascade Road with Timmy and he was rabbiting on as he normally does. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a herd, herd gaggle. What are they? Flock. I saw a flock of chickens come out from somebody's front yard onto the road. I tell you, if there had been scouts out there, I would have been in the Olympics because it was the quickest kilometre I've ever known to be run. It is also a true story that until I met my beautiful wife, I never ate chicken. My mum would serve up a chicken and I would just eat the vegetables. Phobias are real. And we can have a little bit of a laugh about it. But there is some very real fears out there. The fear of rejection is very real for some people. And with the advent of what I call the comparative generation, this is not a problem that is going away quickly. And the reason I say the comparative generation is because we now have the availability to be able to put our very best onto social media or to be able to do these things and throw away the rest. I was sharing earlier that, that I was still in the time where you, you took your role of 24 into the chemist to get it developed and you might have got two good photos out of 24 and you threw the rest away. That's exactly what we do now. Yet what we do is we post the two best ones and we throw away the rest. The fear of failure is very real. And as I say that, every A-type personality runs for the doors. The fear of intimacy is very real. Not wanting to get close to someone because last time we did, we got hurt. The last time we, we got close to somebody, the last time we, we shared about who we are, they let us down. The fear of losing control is very real. And it's a little bit about what I want to speak of today in the fact of we don't step out because we don't want to lose control. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospels. I'm going to be reading from Matthew Matthew chapter 14, I shared last week that I encourage you to read this Matthew during the month of February. We're now day two, so you've got to catch up with it. Do a chapter a day. There's 28 chapters and there's 29 days, so you can actually miss yesterday and start today. Matthew, Matthew is the first of the Gospels, for those who don't know, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Matthew 14, and we're starting at verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had arisen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards him walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said, take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong winds and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus says. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. I've shared about story about this crazy, crazy Frenchman called Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was recognised as the first man to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Niagara Falls from one side to the other 
is 1,100 feet in distance. From land on one side to land on the other is 1,100 feet in distance. It was reported that Charles Blondine crossed the Niagara Falls a little bit down from where the falls was, but crossed 160 metres above on a three-inch cable. That's about eight centimetres. 1,100 feet on a three-inch cable. 160 metres above. It was written in the history books that Blondine did this once across and then back. And it had been sort of advertised that this feat was going to happen. So, so hundreds to actual thousands had started to gather. And when he came back, Blondine then upped the ante a little bit. And the second time he went, he pushed a wheelbarrow. 1,100 feet on a three-inch cable and back. It was about the sixth or seventh time, each time doing something a little bit different, that he was reported that he, he went into the centre taking a little portable cooker and he cooked an omelette. On the twelfth time, he had a chair and he went right to the middle with the chair, balanced it on one leg and stood 160 metres above Niagara Falls. On returning to the side of the lake after that last time, the crowd was now said to be in its thousands. And Blondine turned to them and he said this, You have seen me do this. Who now trusts me? to go on my back. Twelve times he'd done it. Each with a degree of difficulty getting, each with an increasing degree of difficulty. First time he said it, there was silence. So he said again, you've seen me do this, now who wants to put up their hand and hop on my back? Again, there was silence. A third time he asked. There was silence. And Blundine left. You see, everybody believed until it involved them. The first part of the text said, immediately after this, which is in reference to the disciples who had just witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000 family units. This story is written where we've just, we've just read the scripture here where Jesus had just come from feeding 5,000 family units. Not 5,000 people. It's said in there, it's 5,000 men and their families. And he did this with five barley loaves and two fish. Probably enough to, to, to feed one family unit, maybe two. So that Jesus, so that the disciples who were there had seen Jesus perform the miracle of provision. We also know by the scriptures that, that these same disciples had already seen Jesus heal people, give sight to the blind, drive out evil spirits from people. He had, they had seen, these same disciples had seen Jesus raise from the dead. Everybody believed until it involved them. And I've heard this, this, this message preached many, many times. It's, it's a very common message to preach on. And most of the time when, when I've heard it preached on, I've heard about the fact it's preached on Peter. And did Peter lose focus? Did Peter drown because he lost faith and he lost focus? You see, I'm going to ask the question though, is the other disciples had just seen Jesus perform miracles, yet they stayed in the boat. They didn't even get out. They were terrified. In fact, it says in there, in the Greek translation with it, it talks about the fact of when they saw Jesus walking across the water, they thought it was a ghost. 
Yet only six or seven hours earlier, they had been with the same person who had provided the miracle of provision for over 5,000. You see, even for the disciples, everybody believed until it involved them. I find it interesting that in the Gospel of John, he tells this same story, but he does not even, he does not even relate to Peter getting out of the boat. He doesn't even speak of it. He speaks of the waves and the rough sea and he, he speaks of Jesus walking towards him and he says, do not be afraid, I am here. In the quote I read earlier, Peel speaks of two primary forces that ultimately dominate the way we live our life. And I, and I haven't got time to, to speak into to fear or into faith, but I'm going to say that it's not a matter of one or the other. It's the balance of making sure that faith overcomes our fear. You see, if you actually look up, if you Google quotes on fear, the majority of life coaches and so forth and the, and, the, and the quotes I read on fear actually quite disturbed me because they all said that you can't live in fear, that you can't have fear, yet you can't have this. The reality is that we all have some sort of fear in our life. It's about getting the balance right of making sure our faith overcomes our fear. When Jesus said in verse 27, do not be afraid, take courage, I am here. I don't believe he was chastising his disciples for not having fear. In fact, when Jesus reached down his hand to a sinking Peter, he said to him, you have little faith. But I also think that part of him was saying, just do it afraid. Do it afraid. There is parts of our life where fear is very real for us. Very, very real for us. And I'm not saying that every person needs to stand on this pulpit and, and share because glossophobia is very, very real. But I want to encourage you this. When you are given the opportunity to share the gospel with your neighbor, do it afraid. When a friend confides in you that they're having a difficult season, don't just give them prayer emoji type things on a text. Get on the phone. Or maybe better still, get in the car, drop by a cafe on the way there, order two coffees, go around there and actually listen to what is going on in their life. And you may say, I'm not a counsellor, I'm not pastoral. Do it afraid. They've reached out to you because they're in fear. They've got a challenge in their life. They're asking for a balance from you that they can't do for themselves. When you see a need in the church to serve, don't look over your shoulder and think, well, that person can do it better than I can do. They probably can't. They're just doing it afraid. When you desire to, to sign up for a connection point, but that fear overcomes you and the fear of rejection and intimacy that is so very real in your life, I want to encourage you to do it afraid. As we close, I want to go back to the first text that I read out, which was in a letter from Paul to a young Timothy, an audacious young Christian leader an articulate scholar, a man who was doing it afraid. But it, we, if you read through some of the text there, it says that Timothy faced great opposition for what he was doing. It says that Timothy was looked down upon by many. It says that Timothy would face hurdles in trying to share and to start the early Christian church. And so Paul, as a wise mentor, says to him, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind.
It's not that we don't have fear. We do. It's about getting the balance of faith over our fear. Bear Grylls puts it this way. Both faith and fear may sail into your harbour, but the importance is to only allow faith to drop anchor in your life. Did Peter lose focus when he stepped out of the boat? Maybe. Did he fear? He was probably terrified. It says he was terrified. But did he do it afraid? Absolutely. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes for just a moment. There'll be many will enter even this week. School, university, a new season in your workplace. Maybe you're entering into new relationships. Maybe a new job. Maybe you've just moved here and there's a fear of, will I fit in? Maybe you've come in the door today and you're fearing the very presence of what church is. You see, God didn't chastise the people, but what he did say is that we have to get our balance of faith over our fear. What he was saying is that when we have the fear, we need to look to our Heavenly Father. The greatest challenge we face when it comes to fear is fighting it by ourselves. The Spirit came to be a counsellor, a helper, a healer. Yet what we do is that we we have these fears and we get embarrassed by these fears that we cannot overcome them. We are not meant to overcome these things in our own strength. It is in this strength that we do it from God. Just as all eyes are closed, I just want to give you the opportunity now. Maybe fear has overruled your life for too long. And this morning, right now, as we close this service, you want to say, no longer, God, I want to look to you. I want to put my faith in you. I no longer want to be overruled by the fear in my life. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand where you are. Thank you, I can see that hand. Thank you, I can see that hand. We're doing this because this is an acknowledgement for you. Thank you, I can see that hand. This is between you and God. All eyes are closed. Our prayer team would love to pray with you afterwards. But this is between you and God where you know those areas in your life that ha- where your balance is wrong, where the fear has overruled your faith. I just want to encourage you. If that is you, just raise your hand now. Thank you. I can see those hands. Just keep them up just one second, nice and high. Beautiful. Thank you. I can see that hand at the back there too. Put your hands down. We're going to close with a song. But just before we do, what I found beautiful was the same Peter, the same Peter that stepped out of the boat and did it afraid. The same Peter that so much has been written about lost focus and started to drown. The same Peter when he was going under he saw the hand of Jesus come down and rescue him. And it may be that you're on your knees today that you are overcome I encourage you, lift your eyes towards the heavens because Jesus is reaching down His hand towards you. And as an older man, Peter wrote this. 
He said, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He may exalt you. And then He says something beautiful. He says, cast all your anxieties, your fears on Him, because He cares for you. Lord God, we just, you've seen each person's heart today. You've seen those who have responded and you've seen the hearts of those where you are speaking into them, where, where there's, there's areas of our life where, Lord God, our balance has been a little bit wrong between our fear and our faith. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now for each person to get a revelation of the faith that you have to see the hand of you reaching down to pick us up in the times when we can't do it by ourselves. Lord God, we thank you for that. And we give you glory in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless.